Welcome back, America. Choose you. Joined now by United States Senator Ted Cruz. Good morning, Senator. How are you and your family? Everyone doing well? You. Good morning. We're doing terrific, uh, safe, and healthy. Uh, how about you? Everybody is great. And a couple of questions. First, as a friend, then as a senator, I appreciate Texas raising the Ohio Burgie over the Alamo yesterday. I think that was very cool. <laughs> Well, these are extraordinary times. Well, don't you approve of that? Sure. Okay, April Fool, Senator. Gotcha. All right, now I want I want to move on to the serious stuff. <laughs> I, I just figured I'd roll with it. All right, you're a good man. Um, we had the leader on yesterday. He said impeachment interfered with preparedness. I do not know. Now, this is your con law scholar hat. I do not know how anyone could argue it didn't because as a matter of constitutional law, you were obliged in January upon receipt of the delayed articles to go into session on impeachment. It had to, as a matter of physical time, as physics impacted the Senate's ability to be prepared. Agree or disagree? Oh, of course it did. But 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 impeachment is, is a symptom. It's not the cause. Um, yes, impeachment absorbed just about every waking moment for every member of the, the Congress for a couple of months, uh, and it absorbed a lot of lot of waking moments from the administration as well. But but the reason we went down that rabbit hole is 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 the all consuming partisanship uh, that is driving congressional Democrats, and 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 that means even if we hadn't been doing impeachment. The House would have been attacking the president. It's, it's the only thing on their agenda. So in, if you wave a magic wand and imagine some world where they don't happen to impeach the president uh, at the end of last year, uh, they still would have been doing relentless investigations. And, and there still was zero interest manifested by either Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer in the coronavirus outbreak, in, in anything – problematic occurring in China and the Chinese communist government's cover up of the coronavirus outbreak. And, and so it, it is hard to see a scenario right now. You don't have congressional Democrats focused on doing the jobs their constituents elected them. Instead, everything remains, even in the midst of an epidemic, uh, everything remains about attacking Trump instead of doing their jobs. Now, to that end, uh, more in sorrow than in anger, because I like Neera Tandon. I have done a lot of work with her. She is the center, the president of the Center for American Progress. Uh, she describes herself as a progressive Indian American feminist mom wife. I think she's wonderful. She's smart. She's wrong. She's not rotten. She's wrong. But this morning, Jake Tapper tweeted out a Politico story. The Trump administration has decided against reopening the Obamacare enrollment. Blah, blah, blah. Neera tweets, they are monsters. That's our whole tweet. Yeah. I think that is emblematic of the times in which we live. And at this time, this is no April Fool's joke like I began the segment with. This is serious. Yeah. People have to stop this, Senator Cruz. Look, there is a hatred and, and a bitterness and an ugliness in our politics today. It's really unhealthy that, that, that I grieve for our country. Um, you know, it, it wasn't too long ago that we had the State of the Union address, and, and we saw Democrats, ref many of them refused to stand for the president when he entered, refused to stand and applaud what was at the time incredible economic results, the lowest unemployment in 50 years, the lowest African-American and Hispanic unemployment ever recorded, and the Democrats wouldn't applaud for that. And we saw Nancy Pelosi stand up at the end of the speech and rip the president's speech into little pieces. I mean, that was, I was probably sitting 50 feet away from Nancy when she did that. That was just sad. I mean, you know, I, I went to multiple State of the Union addresses Barack Obama gave. I, I disagreed with Barack Obama on a great many policy issues. I think he was, was supporting policies that were harmful to this country. And yet I stood up every time I applauded. I was respectful because I, because I respect the office of the presidency, and, and even more fundamentally, I respect the American people that elected him. There is a derangement that the left has given into where, where orange man bad is, is the only thing they can see. It, it colors everything else. And, and listen, Hugh, you know, I, I, I think it's fair to say my, my relationship with Donald Trump has had its ups and downs. 
<laughs> I've got some Trump tattoos as well, Senator. <laughs> so so I, I can understand frustration people might have with him or disagreement on something he might say or do. I understand that. But but the pathological fury and rage that no matter what the president's doing, that, that their, their only instinct, it's Pavlovian. Whatever happens, attack Trump is all they have. And you know what? It's, it's not just Trump. It, it's, it's gotten to the point that there's also, I mean, we see it, we, we see it in our communities with this, this bitterness of someone who disagrees with you politically uh, is the enemy. As, as, as you noted, uh, she tweeted, tweeted earlier today, you know, is the enemy and, 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 you know, we must unfriend them on Facebook. We must, must not speak with them. I think everyone just needs to relax. Look, if you're, you know, if, if your politics disagree, I, I've got a lot of friends. I, I remember when I was in college and I, and I was a college debater. I was the chairman of, of the conservative party in our debating society. Uh, a very good friend of mine was the head of the liberal party. And we would debate it every week. We'd have, you know, big policy disagreements. And then we'd go out and get a beer, and you know, and, and, and he'd call me a fascist. I'd call him call him a, a, a socialist, and we'd get another beer. I mean, like, ratchet down a little bit and treat each other as human beings, it, particularly during a global health crisis and an economic crisis, crisis both of which have everyone scared. Uh, now is not the time for the relentless partisanship that has characterized the last three and a half. Years. I agree. I agree. Two of my oldest friends with whom I am talking continually through this crisis, Mark Guerin and Dan Poneman. The former was the deputy chief of staff for Bill Clinton and the head of his Peace Corps. The latter was the deputy energy secretary for President Obama. All I do is care about my friends. I, they're just wrong. They're, they're just not, they're not rotten. They're wrong. And we got to get back yeah. to that. Let me talk about now the CARES Act because yeah. you are, are zooming in on how this helps people. And I want people to understand what it does for them. You have the floor, Senator Cruz. Well, last week we passed over $2 trillion in emergency relief legislation. Uh, let me start by saying, listen, the price tag is a big deal. $2 trillion is an enormous amount of spending for the federal government. That's about 10% of our national debt that we spent in one day. And, and in ordinary circumstances, that never would have happened. Uh, these are not ordinary circumstances. This is a crisis uh, a, a public health crisis and also a devastating economic crisis as millions of Americans have lost their jobs. And, 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 and unfortunately, it looks to get worse before it gets better. What we included in the legislation was emergency relief trying to target the populations that are really, really hurting. And I say I don't call it a stimulus package. I call it a relief package because it's designed to, to help people who are hurting as a direct consequence of government policies that have been implemented to stop this global pandemic. So one very important element of the bill is individual relief. Every American in the country, if you make $100,000 or less, you're getting a check in the mail from the U.S. government. If you make $75,000 or less, you're going to get a check for $1,200 per adult. That means a couple making $150,000 or less will get a check for $2,400. And for kids, you get $500 per kid. So a couple with three kids will be getting a check for $3,900. That's real money. That's designed to provide relief to a family that's worried, how, how do I make the next rent check? Maybe you've been laid off. Maybe you're sitting at home going, okay, I got bills that are coming due. My, my daughter's braces, I got to pay for those. What do I do? That's designed to be, be an emergency bridge loan to people who are hurting. That's one very important part, part of the bill. Another very important part of the bill is for small businesses. Small businesses all across the country are going out of business or on the verge of going out of business. This bill provides $377 billion dollars in emergency loans to small businesses. Those are coming through the Small Business Administration, and they're being implemented, they're being administered uh, through your local banks, through your community banks, through, through the same bank you, but your business has been working with in the past if they're an accredited small business loan, lender. You have a guaranteed loan 
up to $10 million, and this is for any business that has 500 employees or fewer. And here's the part that's critical. If those loan proceeds are used to pay salaries, if they're used to pay rent or mortgage for your business, if they're used to pay utilities, the basic cost of, of, of the small business, then those loans will be forgiven. In other words, they become grants. This is designed to, to help all of the restaurants and bars and, 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 and nail salons and hardware stores and movie theaters, help them keep their employees on payroll, keep a paycheck coming. Uh, and this is designed to be a bridge loan to get us through this economic crisis. It won't solve the problem. To solve the problem, we've got to solve the global pandemic. We, we've got to get people out of their houses and back to work. Once we solve that problem, demand comes back, and, and all those small businesses have customers again. But as we move through that time, this bridge loan is designed to, to, to stave off bankruptcy, keep small businesses solvent, and keep millions of Americans getting their paychecks. Now, Senator, uh, there will be a phase four. The leader doesn't want to do it quickly. I've talked to your colleagues, uh, Senators Blunt and Sullivan, this morning. They know eventually there will be one. In the interim, whether by executive order or in phase four, I want a bond campaign like World War II or World War I. I want a pandemic bond so that every citizen in small denominations can help pay for this tab, which is enormous. What do you think about modeling a pandemic bond campaign or a public health bond campaign or the moral equivalent of war campaign on what we did in World War II and World War I? I, I think it's a good idea. I think there are many lessons we can learn from wartime efforts. Um, we are facing a challenge that is, it, it is very much a, a, a wartime effort. It is possible, uh, as the president told the American people yesterday, uh, it is possible that we will have a death toll that, that exceeds the American death toll of many wars. Um, this is an enemy that is invisible. Uh, it's an enemy that, that we don't know how far it's spreading. We can't tell if someone is asymptomatic. We can't tell yet if they're carrying it. And, and it's an enemy that, in terms of our economy, the policies the government has put in place to keep people safe, of, of shutting down businesses, shutting down schools, having people work from home, those policies make sense from a public health, health perspective, but they also have an unprecedented impact on the economy. We've never, we have never shut down the U.S. economy to the extent we have in the last couple of weeks. If Congress hadn't acted at all, if we hadn't had this emergency relief bill, um, I think we could very easily be looking at unemployment rates of 20, 30 percent numbers. I mean, those are Great Depression numbers. Those are numbers you and I haven't lived through. Um, and so I think we ought to approach it with the seriousness of a wartime effort, with the seriousness of what are the resources we need? How do we marshal those resources? How do we mobilize them? And, and defeating the global pandemic has to be our priority we can do that we can do that by focusing on testing and protective gear we can do that by focusing on equipment and vaccines and a cure that's where my focus is but at the same time relief for people who need help senator ted cruz always a great pleasure to talk to you keep coming back uh follow him at ted cruz on twitter